Coming up next on Arizona Horizon, another study on how voice-activated technology in cars impacts driving skills. Also tonight, we'll hear more about a recent Chamber of Commerce study on education, and we'll learn about efforts to help low-income students prepare for a college entrance exam. Those stories next on Arizona Horizon. Arizona Horizon is made possible by contributions from the Friends of Eight, members of your Arizona PBS station. Thank you. Good evening and welcome to Arizona Horizon. I'm Ted Simons. AAA has released the second phase of a study that looks at the impact of voice-activated technology on driving. Here now to talk about the results of the research is Stephanie Dombowski of AAA Arizona. Good to have you here. Thanks for joining us. Thanks for having me. This is the second phase of a study. What exactly are you looking at? Right, so um, as a safety advocate, Last year, we took a look at um, different distracting behaviors in the vehicle. So we conducted a study on um, different behaviors while people were driving, and we rated them on a one to, uh, one to five scale, similar to how we rate hurricanes, right? So a one is the least severe or the least distracting, and then a five is extremely severe or extremely distracting. And in that study, we found that um, voice-activated features, using those when you're driving, so um, speech-to-text type features in um, in-car infotainment systems or on the cell phone, that rated a three. So we wanted to take a closer look at that for the second phase of the study, and that's what we did. We evaluated the infotainment and voice-activated feature systems of six auto manufacturers. Um, they're the manufacturers that had the largest share, so the most cars on the road with these, with these systems in them. Um, and we rated them on a 1.5 scale. And we had drivers um, hooked up to all kinds of devices while they were using them. They were monitoring brain waves and heart rate monitors and tracking their eye movements to see um, reaction times and missed visual cues. Um, and basically the overall results are that hands-free are not risk-free. Yeah, and because you're you're doing something other than concentrating fully on driving. Exactly. But as, as far as voice-activated technology is concerned, what exactly is that? Is that me with my a, a, a earpiece into my my cell phone, listening to music or talking on the phone? Is it the the things in the car where you're punching buttons all over? What it, what define it for? Us? It's when um, in a vehicle you can push a button and say call home or find gas station or you're talking to your vehicle or a system on your cell phone or in your vehicle trying to get it to give you some sort of information. So even though you're doing that and your eyes are on the road and you're still paying attention to the road, the fact you're simply doing that, that's a distraction. Exactly. Is exactly. it, what about things like Siri? I got, you got your iPhone there and you're doing the whole Siri thing. Is that a, included in the study? Yes, we actually took a look at Siri too. Um, and on the one to five point scale, Siri ranked a four. Um, and we did, so the, the vehicle systems, we had them do two simple tasks. It was um, tuning to a radio station and then voice dialing. So, you know, change to whatever station and call home or something like that. Siri, we had her do a little bit more complex tasks because she can or is supposed to. So she was doing things like composing emails, um, updating social media statuses and things like that. And it was the iOS 7 version, which has since, you know, been upgraded. So, um, but she, she was rated the most distracting of anything, of any in-car system to use while driving. I, you know, I can understand that because she's getting things wrong all the time. You, you ask to, you know, call A and which A do you want? You exactly. know, and it, it goes on and on and mm -hmm. you find it. So, um, as far as these, these technologies are concerned now, the car makers that did the best, the ones that could use some help as far as less distraction. Right, so what our study found, we looked at six manufacturers. So it was um, Toyota, Hyundai, Chevy, uh, Mercedes, Chrysler and Ford. Okay. Um, Toyota ranked the best. Their Intune system was about a 1.7, just about as distracting to a driver as listening to the radio. So their system performed very well. Um, the most distracting was Chevy's MyLink system, and that was about a 3.7, and Ford was just behind it at 3.0. And what made the F Ford and Chevy's more distracting than the Toyota? The complexity of the system. Just like you mentioned, talking to Siri, she's getting things wrong. Things like that when you have to repeat yourself, or if there's a specific format you have to use to get the system to understand you, um, maybe it's pulling up a list, you're saying call mom, and it pulls up all seven of mom's phone numbers, and you need to look at a screen to choose it. So the more complex and the less accurate the system was, the longer the interaction time and the more distracting it was. Is, is the fact that some of these things make you look, you need to look at a screen in order to do X, Y, or Z, is that a major fact? If you just keep your eyes on the road and talk, is that better? Um, you know, it really varies. I think that the, the most important thing is that um, we remind drivers that just because we can talk to our cars doesn't mean we should be. Mm -hmm. um, and, and, and it's really uh, creating kind of a false sense of security for drivers because 
they're getting it through their heads that they need their, their eyes on the road and their hands on the wheel. Um, and they're doing that. And they think that, you know, this system's in my vehicle. Sure, it must be safe. But unfortunately, this study is showing that just because your hands are on the wheel and your eyes are on the road, your mind is now someplace else. And that's not safe either. Well, is that, I remember when, you know, the idea of having a headphone and maybe a little microphone and you're, you're talking on the phone because your phone's down there, mm -hmm. that that would be better than holding the phone up here while you're trying to drive. You're saying that even the headphone and the microphone in some many cases is better than some of these voice activated technologies which are supposed to make life easier. Exactly. Yeah, some of those those just talking on a phone um, while you're driving ranked about a 2 where these voice activated features just the mental workload is about a 3. Okay, so what do we take from these findings? And, and, and by the way, is the study continuing? Will there be a phase three? Yes, the phase three studies are already underway. Um, we hope to see that early in 2015. And I believe they'll be taking a more, even more in-depth look at these voice activated systems and how we can improve them. And, and the study, you know, we don't want to point fingers at, you know, Chevy or whoever did, you know, system scored worse than another. It's really to start the conversation on one, we need to take a look at these systems and how safe they are for drivers. Um, they're, they're being released on the roads at crazy speeds. Um, just because they're in the cars doesn't mean they're safe. So we want automakers to continue to improve the accuracy of them to make them safer. You know, the convenience is great. Um, but then we also want to remind drivers, again, that our main priority when we're in that car is driving and to drive safely. Yeah. All right. Well, very interesting stuff. Stephanie, good to have you here. Thanks for joining Thank us. Thank you. U.S. Chamber of Commerce Foundation Center for Education and Workforce recently released a study on the status of education in all 50 states. The report gives letter grades to K-12 systems identifying states as education leaders and laggards. Here now to discuss the report is Arizona Education Association President Andrew Morrill. Good to see you again. Thanks for having me on, Ted. Um, this report is, uh, we've talked about this before on the show before, but in general, overall academic achievement got it. This is basically an indictment on Arizona public schools. What do you take of it? Well, you know, it's probably more useful to talk about it as uh, being helpful where and unhelpful where. Where does this report actually shed some light on things here in Arizona. Um, it, it does represent kind of a giant disconnect because we don't really need a U.S. report to tell us what the challenges are here. On the other hand, it is always beneficial to hear from the business community what their expectations of schools are, how they define success, what's on their minds. We have that in Arizona here with the Arizona Business and Education Coalition, a little closer to home. Mm -hmm. uh, on the other hand, uh, you know, nobody is issuing this kind of report where it would do the most good, which is for our 60,000 classroom teachers in Arizona who are now trying to teach standards that the business community wanted. That would be a good report. Okay, this report, and it's Chamber of Commerce here, so this US is not, not too surprising when we find the return on investment uh, regarding the high achievement relative to state spending, they give a state a B. As far as parental options, charter schools, tax scholarship programs and such, gave the state an A. And yet achievement all up and down the line, whether you're ready for the workforce or ready for secondary uh, bad grades, C and lower. Again, what are we supposed to take from this considering it was a Chamber of Commerce report? I think you see the tracings of an agenda. Even in the introduction of the report, there is a disclaimer that says we're not trying to forward any particular policy pieces. At the same time, the report grades states higher, not only for a lot of choice options, but if there's money directed to help parents with those choice options. So if I'm giving your state points on a scale for certain things being present, then I think we can say that I value those things and I would recommend them. There's a push for alternative certification under teacher quality. The problem is many forms of alternative certification lead to rapid exits from folks after two or three years in the classroom because they find out they're not prepared. 
There's a push for uh, charter schools, which is great. We have some good charter schools in the state of Arizona. We also have some that are struggling every year, and there are national reports that say that charter school students really don't gain anything over their district counterparts. So is there is there no worth at all in these ratings from this particular report? I, I think one of the advantages of this report is it gives you multiple indicators and allows you to zero in. Yes, there's a particular letter grade uh, sort of offered in summation, but there are a lot of different data points and probably it's worthwhile to look at some of those individually, but you can't just look at the letter grade. You have to go into the assumptions that drove those. Okay, so what kind of, as far as this report is concerned, any report that looks at everything from academic achievement to low-income minority achievement, return on investment, post-secondary workforce, what kind of a report do you want to see? I think that teachers in this state would love a report that says you are behind the Arizona College and Career Ready standards. You have accepted those as a workforce. We know they're presenting challenges. Guess what? We're going to do some research. We're going to put as much money into a report on the top 10 methodologies for teachers, the top 10 ways to make ends meet because we are the state with the largest education funding cuts. How about uses of technology and resources? Let's put the chamber to work, helping educators teach the standards that chambers all over the country have promoted in the college and career standards here. How, so, so again, when, when they say that uh, poor job preparing to compete in a global economy, I think international competitiveness got a D. Uh, that's pretty bad. What do we take from that? What, what can the education establishment say, all right, Chamber of Commerce, you may not be education specialists, but they see global preparedness and they think it's a D. We should yeah, do something here. What, 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 well, you're not going to find out in the report because sadly there's not really a road map to improved practice. And if you look at the goals that led to the writing of the report in the first place, as the chamber characterized them, you don't get a lot of uh, ideas in any of the report that I've seen as to how to get to those goals. What you see is an agenda that we've heard before from the chamber. You know, it's interesting you mentioned agenda because if the agenda is to, you know, more charter schools, more tax credit scholarship programs, a better return on investment, all of which got good grades, and yet all of the results aren't very good, that sounds like it's almost an indictment on the good grades. Uh, more than one person has said that if choice options really improved an entire education system, Arizona would certainly know it by now. Well, why doesn't Arizona know it? Now, what's going on out there? Because there's more to a complex education base structure system, over a million students. Arizona has a very high needs population. We have a number of students struggling. This report didn't really want to take a look at the close association of socioeconomics and, the, and what people, what students bring with them from home into schools, and that's okay. We just would like them to be honest about that and say, look, there are impacts on an education system that may be beyond our ability to assess, they were beyond our scope, and really, as all research shows, teachers struggle with those things every day. They did mention that achievement for low-income minority students, only it was a D, only 15% of fourth graders proficient at readings. It, it, it sounds like the report wasn't necessarily as comprehensive as you would like to see it or as um, involved, and yet it is a bit of a warning flag, is it not? Well, I mean, listen, we don't need a, a report from any national entity to tell us that we have issues here. We have a teacher shortage uh, of terrible proportions. We've had over 500 positions open right now, according to superintendents who are looking to fill those positions this late into the school year. Why is that? Because we've got educators who can't afford to stay in the profession. We are overusing and misusing standardized test scores in a way that teachers don't even recognize the profession, the profession they trained for. We have created an evaluation system that is a better disincentive than it is an actual instrument of performance. And this very shaky three-legged stool is ushering some of our greatest teachers out of the profession. But wasn't that three-legged stool, as shaky as it is, um, wasn't it constructed because in the past these kinds of reports have come out, these kinds of results have shown something needs to be done. It's a shaky stool, but someone figured they had to make something. Well, it's a shaky stool, but we've been cutting the legs out of the funding stool, uh, you know, leg pretty good. And as you know, with a three-legged stool, you take one leg away, you have real problems. The widget effect released a few years ago challenged educators to come up with an evaluation system that really described teacher performance in a helpful way, but it did not contain the massive punishments that Arizona policy has heaped onto that. So there's a good example of where a report probably offered something productive 
And then in the policy arena, uh, the, the consequences became very different. Well, I was going to ask, I mean, it, regardless of how you feel about this particular report, what difference does it really make? Are, 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 are policymakers paying attention? Are, are they off on their own agenda? Is the education establishment off on its own? Are, 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 the, are, the, are the trains ever meeting anywhere? I have a feeling that candidates in an election year are very selective about who they're talking to, and there are a lot of calculations going on about who they're talking to and why and who they're listening to. I think we can expect a very dynamic legislative session in 2015, and I believe you will see some policies launched as a result of studies like these. The trick would be to dedicate as much time, resource, and energy into studying um, what's going on in Arizona and focus our attention on the educators who most need the help. Okay, I'm, uh, I'm the Chamber of Commerce here. I'm the U.S. Chamber of Commerce. I come to you and say, I understand you're not crazy about my study. Uh, help me with my next study. What Let, do you want to see done? Let's do a study on the most effective practices to elevate uh, student achievement to the standards we now have. Let's do a study on the impacts of funding public education well and job creation, because all we've heard for 25 legislative sessions is tax cuts create jobs. It hasn't worked. If that worked, we would know about that as well. There are studies that suggest that you create more jobs and build a stronger state economy with a slow, steady, incremental increase in funding of our public schools. They are economic drivers all over the state. Let's look at that relationship. And for critics who say education funding has increased over the years and we're still not seeing the results, you say... It turns out that the number of students have increased in our system, it turns out their needs have increased, and it turns out the expectations on our schools have increased right along with the funding increases that have come from bits and pieces, but not really comprehensively. All right. Always good to have you here. Thanks Thank for joining us. Thank you so us. much. Inside scoop on what's happening at Arizona PBS. Become an aid insider. You'll receive weekly updates on the most anticipated upcoming programs and events. Get the aid insider delivered to your email inbox. Visit azpbs.org to sign up today. Tonight's look at Arizona technology and innovation focuses on a group of Intel employees who started a program called EqualOp, which helps low-income, high-performing students in the Phoenix metro area prepare for the SAT college entrance exam. Joining us now is Anil Gatetti, CEO and co-founder of EqualOp and a packaging engineer at Intel, and Mountain View High School senior Viva Valdez, who is being helped by the program. Good to have you both here. Thanks for joining us. Thank you for Thank having you. us. Uh, equal Op, what are we talking about here? So Equal Op, as you know, stands for Equal Opportunity. The aim of our organization is to ensure that every student, irrespective of his or her background, believes that college education is within reach. So the way we do is we, we actually help highly motivated but under-resourced students prepare for the SAT at no cost. And how do kids qualify for this help? So uh, the way we do is we actually speak to the guidance counselors from various schools and we also speak to uh, organizations like BA Leader Foundation or Cise and uh, we uh, recruit students based on uh, GPA and also we need a, a student SAT waiver form which uh, only students from low income backgrounds are qualified for. So that SAT waiver form obviously is a big one and it's 3.0, G.A, something along those lines? That that's, uh 
so so that's a different one so we have a uh, gpa is a uh, different criteria okay. so so the students have to satisfy both the criteria okay to uh, get uh, to be eligible for the program and it lasts how long the program so this program runs for 5 weeks and uh, we have we actually convene for two times a week and each class is for around 2 hours okay uh, viva describe how this program has worked for you well during the summer i actually took the act with no preparation and that wasn't very good. I didn't feel very confident coming out of the test. And so with Equal Op and their SAT prep, I think it's really helped me prepare for the test. And I've, I just took the test um, this past Saturday, and I felt very confident coming out of it. And it helps you prepare for the test how? Do they give you a test type of questions? Do they tell you what to focus on? How exactly does that work? So we go to classes actually every Tuesday and Saturday morning. And they're more classroom orientated, so it's more like a one-on-one -on -one tutoring session. Oh, interesting. And it sounds, again, like, uh, as Viva was saying, the emphasis is on the test. This is not necessarily for uh, the quote-unquote well-rounded education. This is for that test. Oh, yeah. So Equilop as such is focusing on a very well-defined problem. Uh, as we all know that SAT plays a very crucial role in helping students get into elite colleges and also get them good scholarships. The main aim of our uh, organization is to make sure that students do well in SAT. So that's our main focus. Yeah. Now, any other friends of yours, any other students at the high school taking this or pe people in other high school? I mean, is it a big class? Um, there was actually two classes of about, I'd say, 20 students, so about 40 students in all roughly, and I did have a couple friends from Mountain View yeah. come with me, and a lot of kids from all over the valley came to Equal Op. Now, after Equal Op, did you take the test again? Mm -hmm. And? And I get my results in two weeks. <laughs> <laughs> okay. How do, how do you feel you did? Well, I felt very confident coming out of the test, and it wasn't as scary as I expected it to be, because Equal Op helped prepare me for what type of questions were going to be on there and how to strategize getting through the test. That's almost as important as the, the actual instruction is having the experience of going through all this where you're not sitting down sweating because it's the first time you've seen a test. <laughs> right. Yeah. It's, and that, that, that is a big deal, isn't it? That experience, that confidence. Yes. And I'd also like to uh, emphasize on uh, the volunteers. The volunteers are our biggest asset. And uh, to, uh, to be frank, all, most of the volunteers are from Intel who share a strong passion for teaching. Mm. And also, uh, to speak about funding, uh, we did receive a huge seed grant from Intel, and that's what uh, actually helped us to get this going. And the beauty of this organization is we actually recycle the books. So the session, the books that we used for fall, we are going to reuse for spring too. So we are, in fact, almost self-sustained because of the seed grant from Intel. I don't know if I was going to find out the results here in a couple of weeks, but what have you <laughs> seen so far as results from Equal Op? How, how are the kids doing? So the way we actually, for us to evaluate, what we do is we actually uh, uh, take the, let students take the SAT diagnostic test before the class, and we take one after the class just to see how they are doing. So we did find an improvement in the scores, and also the reviews from most of the students were very positive because they did learn a lot of information. And, you know, it's a win-win situation for students and also the volunteers out there. And what got you started in this? Uh, so uh, I was in a library one day, and my attention fell on a student who was sitting right next to me. He was trying to solve an algebra problem from an SAT textbook. I really wanted to help him out because he was going bonkers. And <laughs> <laughs> within a few moments, there was a private tutor who came by, and then he helped him out. I then started wondering, how about students who could not afford private tutors? And the very next day, there was an interesting editorial uh, in a newspaper that spoke about how uh, students from low-income backgrounds, despite having good GPAs, suffer from poor SAT scores due to lack of, lack of proper mentorship. Mm -hmm. It also spoke about how these SATs are pretty crucial in helping students get into elite colleges. So that's when it struck me that, yeah, why not equal up? And then I spoke about this with, few of my, uh, with a few of my colleagues at Intel. And that's how we start. And, and, and again, you have to have a pretty good GPA to get into this program. Mm -hmm. Why do you think you had you did so well in school, you did so well with tests in school, yet here comes this test and not so well? What, what do you think was going on there? Honestly, I think it's the four hours of sitting down and taking a test of material that school, I haven't found that's really prepared me to take this test mm -hmm. that's going to help me get into the college I want to go to. And 
I mean, especially with the math section, I forgot almost everything that I've learned from my sophomore and junior year. And so Intel and Equalop really helped me to brush up on those skills, which came up all over the place on and, the test. And what's next for you? We're, we're going to assume you passed. Are you going to go to college? <laughs> what are you going to do? Um, well, when I, I'm hoping to go to school in California and major in the dramatic arts. But for the schools like UCLA and USC that I want to get into, I need a good score and good scholarships. All right. Well, good luck to you. <laughs> Thank and you. And congratulations to you. Great Thank program. You so good much. to have you here. Thank you. Likewise. And that is it for now. I'm Ted Simons. Thank you so much for joining us. You have a great evening. Arizona Horizon is made possible by contributions from the Friends of Eight, members of your Arizona PBS station. Thank you.